Hello, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Roger Royce. I want to welcome you to Tell Radio for our panel for World Kindness Day. Again, I'm Roger Royce. I'm a tax and corporate partner with Haynes and Boone, an AMLA 100 law firm based in downtown Palo Alto. And I'm here today to be your moderator uh, for a panel on the UN SDG Goal 16, Peace, Justin, Justice, and Strong Institutions. I have with me uh, two panelists, uh, Sanjeev Kumar and Bill Ottman, uh, who are going to discuss with us uh, this Goal 16. Uh, before we get into it, I think it'd be good just to start by way of definition. Uh, what, what UN SDG Goal 16 really means is the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. That's the ambition mentioned by the UN through, through this SDG. Uh, in particular, and for our panel, uh, we're going to discuss reducing violence, protecting children from abuse, reducing corruption, ensuring access to public information. Uh, those are just some of the targets set by the UN to achieve this purchase purpose, and, and that's a lot. So with that, um, maybe I could ask our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves. And, and Sanji, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, so I am Sanjeev Kumar and I am uh, sort of like Roger, a lawyer now. I have a, a small boutique law firm uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, we generally do mostly business and uh, IP law. But I have an extensive technology background prior to taking a right term and uh, becoming a lawyer. Um, I have dealt with, obviously, I am a uh, Indian uh, person with Indian of Indian origin uh, moved to US uh, in 1987 for my master's uh, in double E and uh, have had a uh, opportunity to travel the world and uh, manage as well as interact with all different cultures globally. Um, I mean that that's enough uh, for my background right now, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Bill Ottman. I'm co-founder and CEO of Minds. Um, we are an open source social networking platform. And, you know, we've been just hyper-focused on transparency, user privacy, um, been getting into cryptocurrency and decentralizing our infrastructure and really, uh, trying to give the power back to the users ultimately and in, in giving people sovereignty over their data and um and software and i think that you know i'm really excited to discuss the goals because i think that there's a lot of overlap um with what the un is talking about and, and how open source can can help achieve that interesting okay we'll have a we'll have a technology perspective then so let me set the stage a little bit before I jump into our discussion and talk a little bit about the purpose of the panel, which is protecting the next generation. And, and let me give you three kind of guiding principle or overriding principles. Uh, everyone in the society has a responsibility of protecting our younger generation. Uh, children, children's rights are often taken casually. Uh, secondly, there are many factors that affect the well being of a child. There's bullying at school to abuse. Uh, and these are, these are young children and they're prone to numerous dangers. And thirdly, uh, we have a lot of laws and internal regulations, uh, but despite all that, there's a growing concern that children are treated as half humans. Um, so those are kind of just three points I'd like to start with. And with that, let me just kind of jump into to the first thing I'd like to ask you both. What kind of environment is safe for children? What is a safe environment? For children in a very dangerous world in 2021. Does anybody want to start off on that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think that there's an important balance that you need to strike between, you know, obviously not exposing children to um, anything that is for adults. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to shelter children too much because that um, can make them uh, incapable of, you know, being able to adapt when when those uh, experiences do 
come to them. Uh, Jonathan Haidt wrote a really interesting book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it has a lot to do with anti-fragility. And he's a big proponent of, of pushing, you know, even his kids, he lives in New York City and, and he'll even, you know, even like his seven-year-old, I think he'll let go to the corner store by themselves with a phone. But, you know, most people would like never imagine doing that. And so I think that, you know, when it comes to uh, children, children's safety, like, yes, you have to, you know, have, have proper controls in place so that, you know, they don't see anything that is, is too extreme, but at the same time, you know, educating them to interpret and experience adult stuff so that they're prepared for it when it does get to them, because, you know, it's, it's sort of the classic, uh, debate about, you know, when you hide something for a kid from a kid, they want to see it and they're going to go find it. So, and the same, you know, there's been lots of research done on, on bullying and how like banning bullies from schools actually doesn't, I mean, it doesn't stop them from being a bully. So, you know, bullying, you, you really have to, um, show, you know, kind of find that compassion and get to the root of the problem as opposed to just hiding the problem. Interesting. You know, you, you, you kind of hit on something here, the fragility aspect, because I think about the world when I was a kid, and it is much different for kids then than it or was then than it is now. And um, uh, so when I grew up in a rural area where we were probably less concerned about crime, but uh, I had a tr tremendous amount of independence compared to what kids go through today uh, at a very young age without a care in the world that there was anything bad out there in the world that I might run into. And it, it's led me to wonder, you know, a lot, uh, has the world changed or have we changed? And are we just more, was it, was I in a dangerous situation then and didn't know it? Uh, or, 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 you know, or, or is it that world we've become a little overly sensitive? What, what do you think? I mean, Roger, I think uh, to some extent from, you know, I was going to make the same point. Uh, I, mean, I grew up in India. And uh, when I was growing up, we had a lot of freedom in terms of uh, everybody knew everybody in the neighborhood. We played outside all the time. Parents knew that somebody is always somehow watching us, uh, I guess, because everybody knew everybody. And we will play till it is dark and that's when we will show back up. Uh, when my children were growing up in US, uh, even during that time, and my children are almost grown up now, we are, you know, 29 and 26 year old. But during their childhood, there was not as much concern, even in US, about them being outside and not always being watched by the parent. I think now uh, you hear a lot more stories about uh, kids being kidnapped, all the sexual predators, about. Uh, so I, I don't know if the society has changed or we have become a lot more protective, but I kind of agree with what, what Bill said. Uh, to some extent, we are coddling our children too much because they don't get exposed to things. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's kind of an extreme positions. Uh, the kids are a lot more independent uh, in some ways at their ages when as compared to what I was. Uh, they want to do their own thing, and uh, at least in U.S. in the United States, uh, and it's sort of happening in other parts of the world as well. And as to your original question, I think for a a nurturing or good environment for kids, I think the one basic thing which needs to be there is a safe family place where they can go to when they have any issue and they feel that they can talk to somebody and not have to uh, feel like where they are going to be judged or that they did something wrong. Uh, I think we are losing that personal communication uh, where the kids feel like they have a safe place to go to and talk to somebody. Yeah, that, that's maybe a little different kind of safety, but I, but I know what you mean. These days with social media, things follow you your whole life. And, 
and, and Bill, you know, you're kind of in that space. Um, yeah. So, so I guess have have to ask you about that. That's a that's a form of of, of danger that didn't even exist when I was a kid. Um, just online bullying, um, social media, making a mistake, saying something regrettable. Mm. Uh, so it's a much you know scarier world for kids now. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, you know, I, I sort of feel lucky and as I'm sure you guys feel the same. I was probably right at the tail end of, you know, the last generation to not have their entire, entire childhood streaming on Instagram uh, and have all the, you know, naked baby pictures getting, uh, maybe not naked baby pictures, but just, you know, embarrassing stuff from when you're a kid um getting online and that is just it's absolutely a completely different dynamic and i think that ultimately parents need to take more responsibility i think that a lot of parents are putting way too much of their kids lives online and not really realizing that um that could you know in some senses it's harmless once in a while but you know it's just unnecessary. It's like the kid isn't consenting to that. I mean, maybe like let the kid decide to a certain degree. And, you know, there's a balance there, but I think a lot of parents are really not respecting that balance. A lot of parents are also just like sitting on their phones. I mean, I'm even guilty of this a little bit, but like I notice like being on my phone a little bit too much around my kids and, you know, them noticing that. And then, you know, what does that teach them? And so I, I think that, you know, I'm a big proponent of humanity facing our, our problems online and not just censoring the conversation. I think that we're only making our problems worse um, if, if we hide from them. And so, but that's more for adults. I think that, you know, that's an adult problem to take care of. It's not the ch children's, you know, problem to, to cure hate on the internet. Um, but, you know, par ultimately parents and, and Jonathan Haidt, I keep bringing him up, but he, he is a, also a big proponent and he, you know, he's, a, he's an expert researcher on all of this, that, you know, kids should not even be given smartphones till much later ages than than we are giving them. Now they can be super valuable tools for education. I even noticed my two-year-old is like swiping around and playing games on, on a phone. Like, I, I mean, identifying different shapes and it's crazy. Like she, she's actually learning super fast. So it's, um, it's a little bit of both and it, you know, parents just need to strike that balance. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. You know, I was reading just today about that, about kids on social media. I think TikTok, you have to be over 13 to be on social media now. And there was, um, I guess, our discussion or revelation that, uh, that Instagram uh, has had sort of a negative effect on teenage girls' self-esteem and, and image. Um, and maybe Facebook has been found to have some negative uh, externalities. Um, and I know, I mean, is there something we should do about that? Or I feel like, Bill, you're saying that maybe we just have to let the kids get out there and experience these things. Uh, but on the other hand, you're saying do, parents... but with, with oversight, um, yeah. you know, parents need to be keeping an eye on it because it's easy to get sucked down an algorithm. And then the kids, you know, the next second, they're, they're seeing something totally insane. And, you know, um, you know, I'm curious, uh, Shanjeev's uh, perspective here, but the... You know, the augmented reality stuff, the face filters, you know, the self image. Um, now Facebook's becoming meta. You know, they're trying to push people into these virtual reality worlds. And I'm not saying I think there's going to be a potential you know, ton of value that comes from virtual reality. But this idea that kids have this image to live up to and that they're, be, that they're becoming less comfortable with who they are. And they want to apply all these filters to create the version of themselves that they that they wish they could be. I, I think that that is uh, that's a that's a little bit scary for kids because um, it's really important to teach self confidence from it from a young age, no matter like how you look. Yeah, I, mean, I kind of agree, Bill. I think uh, pushing kids to live in a fantasy world is not really preparing them for real life. And I think a person needs to, 
by having those experiences with other folks and having that real uh, interaction uh, allow the child to develop certain in certain ways. I, I mean, I've seen, uh, like you said, uh, Roger, that uh, at what what is what age is the right age for kids to have smartphones? And uh, I used to see that uh, I would have uh, play dates for my daughter when you know when they were teenagers. They are all sitting in the living room and uh, they are texting each other. They are sitting on the couch next to each other and they are texting each other. And I would say that I'm like, okay, I don't understand it. You guys are right next to each other. So what is the need for texting? You know, talk, right? The other thing I think which the, this technology, I mean, you know, I have been a technologist. I was at the early stage of uh, when I was doing my company, we uh, had the first contract for the iPhone with Apple. We were supposed to be the processor inside. Did happen that way. But we were looking at that technology at that point of time. Uh, and one thing which became very, very clear is taking that personal interaction away and turning it into a mode of communication where you do not have to respond in the moment takes away something. When you get an email, you get a text, you don't have to respond right then. You think what you are going to say or you are in this frame of mind where you don't think, it'll just type up something and send it away. But you can't take it away. You cannot modify it. Your it's just a bunch of words, and people can interpret whatever they want if their wording is a certain way. Because you cannot sometimes tell in a written word if it was said in jest or it was actually seriously written. And those modularity modularities of the communication between people sort of gets lost when you lose that personal interaction. And that is very, very important for a young child as they are growing up to figure out what are the danger signals? What is a safe interaction? And that's why you hear so many stories about people getting trapped by you know, the internet people. Somebody had contacted them, they talked them up. And then next thing they know, you know, they are going and meeting them somewhere and it was a sexual predator or somebody like that. So I think getting kids to be able to figure out what is a safe interaction and what poses dangers is very important. Yeah, so I think your point, Sanji, that's a good one. I hadn't really thought about that, is that maybe technology, it's very enabling. It allows people to do a lot of things they didn't do, but it also maybe is not giving children the opportunity to develop essential life skills that they'll need in a real world, because virtual to real world sometimes doesn't translate so well. Is that your point pretty much? Yes, I, I, pretty, pretty much. I mean, I do think that there is a value to having that personal interaction. And also, I mean, it goes more than just the interaction piece because like what Bill said, people, kids used to go out and play all the time, right? Now they sit and play video games. Okay, you are exercising your thumb a lot, but you are not out there and doing the activities where you kind of negotiate with the other kids in an environment where so all those skills that you use in real life sort of don't get developed because you spend a majority of your time in front of a screen or on a phone or yeah so and and you know to to your point about you know missing context from words and you know in chats i mean i even have friends and you know even from personal experience i mean when you're texting somebody and, you know, say you're dating somebody um, and then you send them a message and then they don't respond right away. You know, people get in their own heads. This literally causes depression when, mm -hmm. you know, there's not immediate dynamic conversation. It's called ghosting. Uh, and so, you know, that absolutely has an impact on not just kids, but adults. And, you know, the whole um, popularity contest of it. And yeah, I, I, I think that again, it's really on the parents and kids just, yeah, it, need to get out there and, you know, at least video chat. I mean, at, at, at least try to push them to, to develop those skills. Yeah. Um, but it's really, you know, I listened to this interview between, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Gary V yesterday about the whole meta evolution and you know it's pretty scary like 
because I find it hard to deny the fact that, you know, first we went, um, you know, the internet started, then we moved to smartphones and we, we moved from text to, uh, to video and, you know, video is like a more immersive than text. And so what is the next major evolution of technology after video? You know, cause it's all about higher resolution experiences. And this is gonna, um, that's just the nature of the evolution of technology, higher resolution, more information, more immersive. And so VR and AR do seem totally inevitable, especially, especially considering like the remote nature of work now. Um, you know, everyone's on, you know, look at what I mean, we're on Zoom right now. Like I would not be at all surprised if in the next five years, you see half the people that you're in a Zoom call wearing a VR headset and, you know, your image of them is them like floating in space uh, as some sort of like, avatar that, that, that that's totally uh real i mean look uh roger you know you've got a a, a background you know you got a virtual background so so it's that's where we're going and it's just um yeah gotta gotta keep the physical world we can't lose track of the physical world yeah you don't want to see my physical world behind my office oh, no, but, that's, that, but that's not the point roger the point is for especially for children detachment from reality because they are living in this virtual world all the time is a problem. Now, they will, they will build the skills in areas. I mean, I think Bill was talking about his children, you know, at two years old doing, I was building notebooks at that time and my elder daughter was two years old. And that was a notebook which had a trackball before the touchpads came out. And because we were building machines, I had a bunch of pilot, you know, the pre-production machines. So I gave her one. And at two year old, that girl was, amazingly proficient at using that trackball to do her drawings on that notebook using this Crayola software. Mm -hmm. So every piece of technology which you make available to a kid is going to result in development and skills being developed in certain areas. But it is very important for us and the parents like Bill pointed out to keep that balance we cannot give up on the social skills and the interpersonal skills that the kids have to build. And they are focused on building these other skills, but they lose out on what they need to have in real world when they're interacting with people. Right. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to maybe switch directions here a little bit and uh, go to more of, and this is all really important, I think. It's probably one of the most important things facing our children. But I do want to take this back to what the UN, the UN was concerned about, one of which is reducing violence and bullying and harassment and some of the more negative things. And I think one of the problems that we have is that how do you know, you know, because children, they might not, re, you know, they might be afraid. They might be afraid to say anything. They might just suffer in silence. Um, and, um, you know, what, what can we do? How do we find out and so that we're able to reach out and help? the more vulnerable in our society uh, from some of the bad things that can happen in schools, on the playground, on the street, in town, at the drugstore, wherever. Any, any thoughts on that? I mean, and Sanji, as a lawyer, lawyer, I'm sure you probably see the legal aspect of this. Is there things we yeah, can do so as practical? From my perspective, I think uh, our systems are lacking. And our I kind of made a point earlier on that we are losing out that safe place for the kids or the safe person that they feel completely comfortable to tell whatever is going on in their life. And you are correct. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, we have heard this, seen this in all kinds of victims, right? I mean, they feel like maybe it was their fault why something like that happened to them. Maybe they had, they did something because of which whatever happened to them uh, came about. I think our laws uh, can be changed a little bit to, especially for the more vulnerable, uh, vulnerable piece of our population, segment of our population, uh, where we can make it a little more consequential for people who do those kind of things. Uh, as far as uh, online bullying and all that is concerned. I mean, 
it has existed. It used to be physical bullying in schools and it has moved on to social platform. The difference is in a real world setting, the bully still has to face you to bully you. In a virtual scenario, everybody is a keyboard warrior and because they think they are anonymous, they can just say whatever they want to say, which they may not say to your face, but they feel very free to say very negative and very mean things about people on social media because there are no repercussions, there are no consequences. They don't have to really face the person they are talking about sometimes. And generally the victim is ashamed that something like that is being said about them, especially when they are children and younger, and they don't even want to bring it up because they will be, they think they will be the laughing stock or they will get more of the same from whoever they talk about, uh, to talk to about this thing. So I think we need to start certain things in the educational piece, uh, in our education itself. I think we need to look at our laws. And yes, I think there needs to be some additional regulation, even though I'm a pretty free economy and free uh, enterprise guy, I think there are certain areas where it makes sense to build certain safeguards to protect the people who are vulnerable. Yeah, well, yeah. I can tell you here in California, um, it's a pretty serious thing, uh, an allegation of bullying in a school. And in fact, they may have liability if they don't do something about it. So uh, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the nation, but out here, the, the, the key is just making sure it gets reported. If it does, the schools do a pretty good job of shutting it down. So Bill, more as a parent than as a, as a social media guy, do you have a view on this? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's because I completely agree that the problem online bullying is so easy, not just, you know, for kids, but again, you know, this adults get bullied too badly. And, you know, suicide is a big problem on online right. now. And we all, I think need to uh, develop new muscles for, for dealing with this, especially if you're a, if you're more of a public figure or if you're, um, a big content creator, you know, that's what kids want to do now too. They want to like go viral on, on, on social media. That's like what it's like a little competition for all of them. And, you know, some of them are super successful. And so, you know, ultimately it's all about education to how, for, for how to deal with it, because, you know, simultaneously, we have the explosion of online bullying, but we also have the explosion of sort of this overly sensitive uh, culture where everybody is super offended by everything and people are trying to shame each other and cancel each other. And so, you know, with those two things accelerating at the same time, that's just like a nuclear bomb that you know you're asking for because because when people are getting offended more easily and there's a greater volume of uh, you know offensive stuff being said online, well, no, actually it, we need to change that direction. If we can't stop technology from you know, I don't personally think that it is feasible to stop people from, from communicating. Like you can try, but the, everyone's always gonna find a way around it. It's, it seems more useful to educate and have the networks and platforms and schools educate people on how to, how to deal with it, how to, um, how to navigate. Because I just, I think it, it's something we all need to learn how to deal with. No one likes to get bullied, um, but you know, there is again, some, evidence towards like you were saying kids um you know who everyone we all got bullied a little bit and you know it's it's not necessarily uh popular to say this but you know a little bit is not the worst if you never have anybody giving you a hard time at any point i'm not saying it's good i'm just saying it it is a fact of life that, that we all have to deal with it a little bit. So I don't really agree about, you know, the reg, like in terms of regulations, like absolutely like schools should, should have a certain responsibility not to let things get out of control. But like, I don't really know what kind of laws could feasibly be implemented 
Um, I think the, the resources should much more go towards, towards education and actually towards the bullies themselves because the bullies are the ones who need the help. I mean, they're like having mental problems. So the, the, they, they need to be focused on and, and shown more compassion. They're probably getting ignored by their own parents. And then that's causing them to, to lash out. So, you know, and, you know, we learned this from, we partnered with Daryl Davis, who is, um, he's done an amazing Ted talk and he's a, uh, a famous black musician who befriended hundreds of members of the KKK and got them all to leave the KKK. I've heard about this guy. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's an advisor at, at Minds, and we're sort of trying to bring his strategy online. And I mean, nothing speaks louder than that. I mean, literally the man befriended people who hate him and over time they changed. That is how change happens. So, you know, I, I, I think a lot of the people who might be proposing, um, you know, more harsh punishments to bullies are, are, are sort of not getting at the root of the problem, even though that's an understandable reaction. Well, there is another element to that, actually. I think, uh, I think there is something to be said about uh, giving the people tools to tackle when they, are, they find themselves in that situation. Uh, kind of like what Bill said, if nobody ever gave you a hard time, I don't know if that's also a very good thing, if the life was just a bed of roses all the time for you. I mean, I, I'm on my small city, city council, I've run two elections and social media is a platform where you just cannot have a discussion because people will type what they will never say to your face. So my strategy always was, whenever somebody wrote something totally negative about me, I'll make a public post. Hey, I'll meet you for coffee at least come to know me so that we can discuss whatever issues you have. And then if you still feel like it, hey, don't vote for me, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody ever took me up to have that coffee, right? Because they don't want to change their mind. They believe what they believe. But what they did is everybody else sees that. And sometimes what happens on social media is one person says that and it starts turning into a snowball effect of other people pile on. And then suddenly you are feeling like everybody is throwing off on you. That stops because people say, see what and how you tackled it. So mm -hmm. I think uh, we can incorporate some lessons for people how to deal with that kind of interaction online. I think we're also going to be developing over time new reputation systems online, which can, you know, have greater accountability for you know, trolling and, and bullying, you know, what we do not want is a social credit score, like in China, but we do want, like, I think that there are decentralized, you know, open reputation, reputation systems, which can be developed that, you know, achieve a similar goal, but are not just, you know, basically a centralized, government having all power over somebody's score like that that score it, like how we develop that tech is super important that it's done ethically and in a, in a really thoughtful way but i do think that people ha should have to be accountable for uh for for going you know insane online and just you know and bullying everybody so um i think that tech is gonna solve this problem but it, it'll take time yeah, you know, Bill, I want to circle back to something else you talked about. It, it's really, and again, we're talking about children here for this panel. The bullies are going to be children, other children. And so really, we have to change minds and hearts and make them more empathetic, caring, and, and reacting. Uh, how do we do that? You know, because I think that's the, the real answer. Because what she said, we can't regulate every little thing a kid does. But how do we have a kinder and gentler, uh, I guess, uh, population um, any ideas from either of you? So I mean, I just I, like I learned from Daryl, who is is the the guru, and you know his whole his story. He said that he always approaches um, every new extremist that he talks to um, just by listening, and you know not trying to change their mind. Because the second you try to change somebody's mind, they suddenly shut down. 
uh, it's like when someone's trying to convince you of something, whether it's like a political issue or whatever it is, it's like, you just, you don't want to listen to them when they're coming at you super hard. And same thing. Like if a, if a bully goes to the principal's office and the principal's like, okay, like you're never going to do this again. We're going to, um, you know, this is how you have to be nice to, to the other kids, blah, blah, blah. Like that's just not effective. You, you just really need to sit there and listen and get them to the point where they're starting to feel heard and respected and acknowledged. And, and once they start establishing that, um, that mutual respect, then they'll start showing respect. I mean, it, it is the golden rule. And most likely most bullies have just not been, you know, exposed to people who are, who are showing them respect and are helping them, you know, become a, a positive version of themselves. So I think that what, you know, at the end of the day, it is about kindness. I mean, it, it, you know, this is World Kindness Day. Like if there's nothing more important than that, just, you know, in your own family, in school, in, you know, kids understanding how there's this whole ripple effect of, of kindness, the pay it forward kind of butterfly effect. I mean, that is completely real and it, it spreads. It's like a, it's almost, it's like a social contagion. And um, so I think that it just, it's, it's, it's really not, it's not easy to do that into listening is actually hard, uh, but it's also easy. So I don't know. I, th I think that that, that, that's a good lesson from Daryl. So like in my you... opinion, yeah, in my opinion, uh, Roger, there are just like any, any problem, there is no simple solution or a no simple right way of fixing or providing whatever mitigation you can provide to the problem if you can't solve it. There are, you know, there are some bullies who are just bullies and that's just their nature and they are just mean hearted people and you can't do it. And that's true for children as well. I mean, it's now happening online, but we have always had those sayings of mean girl and the mean boys and that group, which was in the school, you know, they thought they were better than everybody else or, and sometimes, uh, at least in my personal experience, when I was growing up, I mean, you know, like they said, we all have been bullied to some extent and I was bullied and there was a guy in my high school years who just felt like he could just bully me anytime. And I came to realize I have to stand up to the guy, even if I'm going to get beat up. And that's the only way I'm going to stop him. And it only took one time. I stood up to him one time. And after that, he never bullied me. So my point is, there are skills and you have to, but you cannot just use the same solution in every instance. Mm -hmm. Some places you have people who have problems because they themselves are being bullied by somebody else and they are taking it out on you. Maybe their parents are mean to the kid at home. Maybe uh, they take it out because that's their way of releasing whatever they are feeling. So uh, I, I think there is a balance and we, we need to be able to educate kids how to identify what might be the probable solution to the problem and how to go about at least mitigating the impact of that bullying if that can be helped. Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. I was reading um, one of the uh, uh, biographies of Peter Thiel and uh, talking about his childhood. He is bullied relentlessly as a child because he's so smart. So he was kind of nerdy and uh, very focused and, and just bullied relentlessly all the way through college. Um, you know, it's, and I'm sure there's a lot of very talented people that have to go through that and you wonder if it affects them for their life. So it's certainly out there, but what you said, Sanjeev is right. I think it's one of those life skills, you know, kids have to learn how to stand up for themselves. Let me kind of take this one step further. Um, I feel like personally, and, and you're about the same vintage as me, Sanjeev, it looks like, so maybe you can identify, but it feels like we have much more of a culture of hate in America today. Uh, much more than we had before. And a lot of it's, especially in politics, it's no longer, and The Economist just had a big article on this last week uh, about how attitudes have changed and like members of the political parties uh, have much stronger feelings about members of opposing parties. And I remember a time if somebody disagreed with you politically, well, that's, you know, okay, that's just diversity, they have different views. 
now if they disagree with you politically, you better be careful because uh, you know they might really, really be you know on you know just unaccepting of a varying political view. And boy, and it's like on steroids now that we've got social media, because like you said, you can be anonymous, you can hide, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to worry, there's no consequences, right? It's that world where everything is permitted. Am I right about that? Do you think that might be playing into what's going on with, with kids yes. in school these days? I think you are completely right about that. And I have, you know, I mean, I, I am a little bit in politics, even though it is nothing like at the national level, I'm in a small city. But we, we don't have some of those bigger divisions because we don't have to do anything with the race issues or immigration issues or some of those abortion issues which divide the, so, or the social issues, the uh, political divide we have in the country. But I will tell you, I mean, I, I have changed my message. And every time I talk to somebody, I always tell them, I said, the problem is we tend to always focus on things which we disagree upon. I bet you even two people from the two different parties or completely different political uh, uh, corners, you will have a lot more in common than what you disagree upon. We tend to have become a, a society where we only focus on the differences. I personally believe our media does a very poor job because I guess that's what sells. So they focus and uh, make the wherever the confrontation is as the point that they try to sell the news upon and try to sell their stories upon. I mean, in my law firm, it's a very small law firm. We have three partners and, you know, a couple of other employees, associates, right? And we have people from pretty wide spectrum. I mean, I have one partner who is very ultra conservative. I have one partner who is pretty ultra liberal and I'm giving those taglines, even though they might not say the same political uh, piece to that. But you know what? We get along. We can have, we sometimes even have our debates over lunch when we are having lunch about some political thing and they can sometimes get heated. But we still do not start, we don't start hating each other because he doesn't think like me politically. To be able to agree to disagree, respect the other person's opinion and other person's uh, perspective, I think the country is losing it. And I think if we want to save our children, we need to figure out how to inculcate that you can disagree, but still respect the other person as they are growing. Because I think uh, the less human interaction they have and the more they rely upon the virtual world media messages, I think it's only going to get worse because all they see is the divisive message, what they yeah. identify with. Yeah, it's so true. And I, the, the media is projecting that there is so much hate. And then that is sort of building on itself. And it's creating this perception that there is so much hate. And it's almost manifesting itself in a certain way. But actually, I mean, all of the research, like Steven Pinker wrote a really interesting book on just how much better everything has been getting through the course of history, just like, overall vastly less violence vastly yep. less famine all all these types that, of things that's his book rationality i think you're talking about right is that the one yes i, th I think yeah yeah he and and so yeah i mean kids are looking at their parents and their parents can't even talk to their own relative who might be on the other side of this the political spectrum so obviously kids are mirroring that behavior and you know they're going around. I mean, if the media says that, you know, the Trump supporter is a racist and the parents say it, then the kid's going to go and say it too. And, you know, in the same way and the other way around, if the kid has conservative parents and is calling all of the liberals, like, you know, communists who are trying to take over the country and, you know, then those kids are going to, you know, feed off of that. And it's just really um, immature and, it, 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 it really needs to change. It's, I, Sanjeev, I wanted to ask if you had heard of the, uh, the University of Austin project that has started. Have, have you heard about that? What is the project? There, well, there's a new sort of initiative to start uh, the University of Austin. And it's all oh. about, yeah, you should oh, check I'm it out. Not. I think it's at uaustin.org. Yeah. And you know, their whole 
philosophy. It's founded by Barry Weiss and um, people like uh, Lex Fridman and a number of like uh, professors are, are, are getting involved and it's all about like the relentless pursuit of truth and, um, you know, the full spectrum of ideas and being open to the debate because it's so many universities are basically becoming politicized and they're not allowing certain conversations to happen and everything is so fragile. And so they're, they're, they're trying to, to, to bring that back to uh, to the university because there, there's very few universities that are really like ruthlessly defending intellectual discourse um, as as it needs to be defended and so I think that I think a lot of the fragility is is coming from a good place you know people think that they're protecting their kids by uh, you know, shutting them off from, from certain types of uh, information that, that they might need. But you know, that, that can have pretty drastic consequences and, and, and makes people unable to cope with people who think differently from them. So uh, we have to redevelop that muscle. And I really, I ultimately think that you, know, you, can't, you can't stop the ideas from from being shared and so it's just that's sort of like the nature of the universe to me i i just i i i think that the information is gonna want it wants to be free it want it, it wants to get out there so so you know we have to train ourselves ultimately and then and that that can emanate out okay all right. Um, so kind of last little topic, I, I guess we'll, we'll cover here, and we've already hit on it quite a bit. It's, it's really how do we prepare our children for, for the world? How do we prepare them for the tough situations they're going to encounter? I mean, an old guy like me, I can't give anyone advice on how to deal with social media. I can't. I'm not even good at it myself. So how do we, you know, how do we get, because what you said, Sanjeev, about standing up to the bully, I mean, every kid in the world has had that talk with his dad, and you know, where he says, look, you know, here's how you stop a bully, you know, you stand up to him. I don't know how to stop a bully online. If I did, I, you know, <laughs> you know, I'd probably have the secret. So how do we prepare our children for the tough situations they're going to run into uh, these days? Any thoughts on that? It's a tough one, Roger. I mean, frankly speaking, uh... My experience has been is you cannot, you cannot really shut down the bully on social media because <clears throat> there's there are so many roadblocks for you to be able to do that. Number one, they don't care because there are no consequences for them. Number two, you sometimes don't even know who it is. Number three, there is no real argument that you can make to convince them to see the fallacies of their ways because Anything you write, they will analyze and overanalyze and try to interpret it in a certain manner where they will make you look even worse. So my principle personally, I mean, like Bill said, it's not just the kids who get bullied on social media, adults too, and uh, I faced that during election cycles. My, my strategy was simply, I ignore it. You get number one, thick skin, or mm -hmm. number two, offer them, hey, maybe you have some misinformation about me or maybe you know you are thinking what you are thinking because of whatever you believe is not true how about we meet how about we get to know each other a little better so maybe you can make up your mind and we don't have to be friends you can think i'm not a good person or whatever you are writing about me you you might be right and that's okay we can agree to disagree and move on but i just i really do not have a very good strategy of stopping a online bully except to just ignore it well, I think that, that that absolutely is a strategy that is is an important part of the equation. I mean, even uh, a lot, of, I know a number of celebrities and, and big public figures who uh, will always say, do not read the comments. You know, if you make, a, like they just won't even read the comments because when they do, you know, even if you're a celebrity, you can still become depressed by the comments of, of all the mean people online. And so their strategy is just don't read the comments, like be you post what you want to post you, you know, you believing in yourself is, is the most powerful thing. And, you know, 
there's an old old adage uh, on the internet: don't feed the trolls. <laughs> and so when you like, because that's what they want. They they're trying to get a reaction out of you. They want to make you upset. They and if you if you become upset, then that that is just fueling them, and that they'll just keep doing it. So so ignoring them or um, you know being able to to you know I don't want to say play the game because you don't want to fe- you know fuel the fire, but you know I, if you look at comedy. And, you know, we saw all this stuff with Dave Chappelle happening recently um, on Netflix. And, you know, he, he gave a special, he, he did a special uh, comedy show and, you know, he brought up some issues about, uh, uh, you know, trans and, and, and feminism. And it was really, you know, pretty crazy to watch because if you actually watch the special, he tells a story about a trans friend of his who uh, was a, a comic who opened up a, a, a comedy show for him. And that, that unfortunately, that trans woman um, eventually committed suicide. And it was, he, he went into this whole um, really, really sad story about it. But then people who didn't even really watch the special just because, you know, they heard that there were trans issues, you know, they started attacking him and trying to get him canceled, even though he was talking about his friend who was trans in the special. And just the whole thing about comedy and bullies kind of do this, is that there's like a dark comedy, you know, these almost like sick jokes. And and I do think that, that dark comedy is a legitimate, form of uh, venting and dealing with issues and, you know, just so, so I think that there's an important skill and dark comedy goes along with being able, just having that muscle to be able to deal with criticism. It's sort of like, cause the context, just because you say something mean and offensive doesn't mean you actually mean it. It doesn't actually, when a bully says something mean, it doesn't even mean that they actually mean it. It means that there's something going on in them where they're using it as a tool to deal with some other issue that they're having. So I, I, I think developing the ability to take a joke and, and because when a bully sees that you're just like taking the joke and like having a good time or almost like, like that's, that's what shuts a bully down is is almost like ha- let showing that it has no impact on you and almost just you know because you are confident in yourself and you're not going to let a bully like an insecure bully ruin your day so i you know that's the skill that i think at at a young age i mean you know sticks and stones uh maybe may break my bones but words will never hurt me it's not that words don't hurt words definitely do hurt but you know, words are, are, we need to be able to use our words because if people can't use their words, then they're going to resort to violence potentially. So, so it's very important that we're all able and promoting the use of words because, you know, words are, are our best tools to, to not be violent. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's a little bit naive to think, you know, words will never hurt me. But, you know, developing that, that ability to, uh, ha- to take a joke, you know, some people call it chirping, you know, uh, th- there's a lot of value to, to, you know, poking fun at your friends and you can like develop camaraderie in that sense. And so it, it, it's not black and white, it's totally gray area, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we just, we, we, we have to be w- learning self-confidence and, you know, that, cause that's what bullies respect. That's what everybody respects. People respect yes. other people who are confident. Yeah. So, so I, I, I know you want to say something. So I'll yeah, I wanted that. to say this. I agree with Bill. I mean, a bully generally gets their power from your reaction. If you react to their bullying is how they will continue the bullying. If you do not react, generally it stops. Now, there is one big difference between that real, t- real world bully and the bully online. There is a, another power 
that bullies online use, which is generally not available to them in physical world. When somebody is bullying you in physical world, it's generally that one bully against you. They don't get a bunch of people helping them. But it happens on social media a lot easier. You might not respond, but five other people will lend them their voices because for whatever reason, they agree with the bully's position. And now you have multiple bullies and they feed on each other and they will keep on posting about you negative stuff, even though you don't respond. But I think uh, what Bill said is very true. I think that skill set of either ignoring it or at least taking that joke, taking that criticism, whatever you want to call it, and uh, not getting depressed, learning the skill not to get depressed, not to get negative about your own, you know, image. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. Self-image comes a long way. So if, if, if they have people, the children have, parents and family who are actually providing them the reinforcement they need that you are a good person, you do have these qualities, you have these values. It makes it a lot easier on those kids to actually take that criticism versus somebody who is already not feeling good about themselves. Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour here. So I, I think Sanjeev, we're gonna give you the, the last word on this. Um, oh no, Bill, uh, you can have the last word. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think you, you nailed it. I think we ended in, in a great spot there. You know, I, as, as, as founder of a social media site, I get trolled plenty and, you know, but sometimes I'll even share the posts that, you know, when people are making fun of me and I'll just like do a like smiley face. Cause it's, right. you know, so again, that in, in some things are over the line, but you know, I think this was really productive and uh, yeah, I really appreciate talking to you both and, and, and having the conversation. All right, I want to thank you both for being here. Thank you, Sanjeev Kumar. Thank you, Bill Ottman. This is Roger Royce. We're here on Tell Radio discussing the UN SDG Goal 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, especially as it relates to children. Uh, Roger Royce, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>